so how lucky are we today to have this panel? Um, we've already had one great panel session and we've now got a, another excellent group of people up here to contribute to our discussion today. Professor Graham Samuel AC, who's sitting second from the left over there, um, has many current roles. If I went through them all, um, we might be here for 10 <laughs> minutes, so I won't. I've highlighted a couple to give you an impression of his incredible expertise and contribution to as a public servant and to uh, regulatory environments. He's involved at the moment with the Monash University Business School, Australian National University, Dementia Australia. Um, he's also involved with Digital Health, Airlines Australia for Australia and New Zealand, and the National Health and Medical Research Council. Um, he recently conducted a review of for the Commonwealth on Food and Grocery Code of Conduct, and also um, a review into uh, the accountability of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, which um, some of these issues have been very topical in terms of financial services industry. So you can see just from that introduction how many different regulatory environments he's had experience with, and that's his sort of current CV. Um, in the past, he was, of course, very well known as the former chairman of the ACCC, and also he's been involved with um, ACMA, so the Communications and Media Authority and the National Competition Council. He was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia in 1998, <coughs> and in 2010 he was elevated to a, a Companion of the Order of Australia for eminent service to public administration through contributions in the area of economic reform and competition law and to the community through leadership roles in sporting and cultural organisations. So welcome to Graham. John Merritt, who's sitting on the end in the brown jacket, um, he has, is an advisor to numerous ministers, boards and chief, chief executives. Some of you will know him uh, most for his roles at uh, Vic Roads and the EPA and WorkSafe. Um, and Transport Accident Commission and also the National Safety Council of Australia. Um, he provides advice on leadership, culture, engagement, strategy and change um, and has a particular um, expertise around regulatory practice. And again, together with Samuel, has experienced many different regulatory environments and uh, some of the same issues that this industry is facing in terms of regulatory challenges. Um, he also is an expert at managing stakeholders through his roles and um, was a regular commentator on, on radio for many months in his various roles. So he's used to engaging with the media. He holds a degree in economics um, and has also completed uh, management uh, business school studies um, to uh, supplement his professional development. He's been to the London School of Economics and is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Next to uh, Graham is Trevor Pischiotta. Um, some of you will have met Trevor. He joined the building policy area at DELP um, a couple of years ago now, about two years ago, um, when an, um, Angela Jurovic left, who, who had that role for a very long time. And, um, what a great find he's been. He's a, a, a very good thinker in terms of the challenges facing um, the sector. Pr prior to being involved in building policy and reform in his current role, he um, was at the Department of Premier and Cabinet and had a number of roles um, relating to major projects and infrastructure work. Um, he was also at the Treasury, Department of Treasury and Finance and before that at uh, Department of Human Services. So we welcome Trevor. And standing in for Mark today, um, we've got Matt Vincent, who's an executive director at the VBA um, and is responsible for the statewide cladding audit um, there. Um, but he has worked at the EPA and at the Department of Premier and Cabinet as well, so brings other regulatory um, frameworks to his current role at the VBA. So, this session is entitled, What Does Good Regulation Look Like? And we're very lucky to have this group of individuals with their collective knowledge to give us a bigger picture view of what's going on in this industry and how these issues present um, and how we can regulate better. Before we address that particular question, I want to ask Trevor, why do we even regulate in the first place? 
and how does all this begin in terms of creating responsibilities um, that Parliament give then to, uh, to uh, regulate particular sectors? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Bronwyn. Um, so that's probably the, um, that might be the only question you asked me today that I'm qualified to answer. So I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm the only individual on this stage who is not a regulator and has never been. Um, but I guess one of the things I do think a lot about uh, in the policy role that I occupy is um, why do we have the rules and regulations that we do? Why does the state step into this space at all? Um, and, and the reality is that for me it's about, um, you know, what are the public, what's the public good outcome that the government of the day and the parliament has sought to achieve? So when the parliament and the government enact legislation, enact regulations, they do so because they know that uh, if they don't step in, uh, bad outcomes will happen, whether that's consumer detriment, it might be uncertainty for industry that undercuts investment, uh, it might be liability sitting in the wrong parts of, of the supply chain. And so they intervene and they make rules and regulations, whether that's through legislation or regulation, to try and, I guess, mitigate those negative outcomes. Um, and so, you know, the, the answer to the question for me of why regulate is, is to bring about those positive public good outcomes. So to protect the community, to protect the, economic, the, the economy and ensure um, an environment in which economic growth can, um, can occur. Um, and to ensure that the industry that, that is being regulated can operate as efficiently as possible um, while still achieving those outcomes. Yeah. John, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, look, uh, Trevor's right. I, uh, it's particularly pertinent, obviously, in the building industry because, um, I mean, one of the miracles of Australia over the last century has been that a relatively small population has managed to create a first world standard of living in this vast landmass. And it's done that because it's got one of the most amazing building and infrastructure industries in the world. It is absolutely incredible. Um, what makes it amazing is its ability to suck people into it, go like the clappers and then dissolve back, again, uh, back down again as the economy ebbs and flows. So one of its strengths is it has next to no barrier to entry. Um, uh, we, when, I, when I've been involved in the past, we'd laugh about the number of pastry cooks you'd find as plasterers or painters. During the current boom, every man and his dog has suddenly become a construction worker. It's fantastic. Except, if we don't hold that industry to account, seriously bad things happen. Uh, I've always been attracted to um, the theory of um, an academic named uh, Galbraith, who's out of ANU, has written extensively on regulatory practice for decades. And he originally coined this notion that in all forms of public um, compliance, there's about 5% of the population who generally are recalcitrant and do the wrong thing. Sometimes it feels like huge numbers, but in most instances, it's only about 5% who are genuine grubs. There's about 20% of people out there who it seems no matter what happens, they always do the right thing. They pay their taxes on time, they follow the speed limits, they, they're just great. The rest of us, the great unwashed, the 75%, are generally happy to do the right thing, but whether we do or not depends on what we see happening to the five. And uh, as complicated as we often make regulatory uh, practice to be, it's not that complicated. Find the five, kick the shizen out of them, and then tell everybody about it. Now, in construction, it, that matters more than anything else. Because there are such low barriers to entry, because anyone can buy a nail bag, anyone can come in there and call themselves a carpenter when they're not, anyone can um, you know, buy sheet plaster, anyone can be a painter uh, with plastic plumbing, you can almost anyone can be a plumber. So, you know, if we don't find that five and stick it into them, the good ones won't stay, right? The, the good people will not be able to do good work and make a margin. You'll drive them out. That's our job. Our job is to make sure that good people can do good work and make a margin. I want to bring Graeme into this discussion, but shift it a little bit. So 
there's been a lot of focus and talk about the Hain report into the uh, banking and financial services sector and he made some very critical comments about the regulators in those sectors. He said that ASIC's culture needed to change and he sent some very clear messages to ASIC. He said, and this could apply to any sector, and this is why I think across government this has sent ripples in terms of the messaging that he's now giving to all regulators. He said, the community is entitled to expect and does expect that financial services entities will comply with laws. Compliance is not a matter of choice. The law is coercive and its coercive character can be neither hidden or ignored. Negotiation, persuasion without enforcement all too readily leads to the perception that compliance is voluntary. It's not. All financial services entities substitute building and construction industry entities must obey the law, not just those that are willing to do so. And all financial services entities must comply with all laws that apply to them, not just with the bits of the law that they find commercially acceptable. That is a message to all of Australia and all regulators. Graham, what, what do we need to take from that? This is, this is a really strong call to action from, from Kenneth Hayne. Yeah, look, I thought <coughs> Haynes' report, the, the, I saw an article today to say that uh, it was a bit of a squib. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was a very powerful report because rather than doing what often will happen is people say, well, we've got to have new law here, new law there, new law here, new regulation. He said, don't need all that. He said, what we need is the proper culture in place, which comes from the top. And he said, we need regulators that are going to remind those in the industry that have had a big wake up call from this process to stay awake, not to fall asleep and become complacent. Now, see, I agree with John and with Jeff that, that when we talk about the, 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 the law and, and why we have these regulations, um, it was put in place, it was actually solidified in 1995 when um, uh, Paul Keating, as uh, then Prime Minister, and all the states and territories got together and they said, look, let's look at all our laws. Markets are really the thing that will drive better practice, but where markets are likely to fail, where competition fails, then in the public interest, governments have to step in and make the laws. And that's what they've done. They've stepped in to make laws where competition is not going to necessarily work to protect the public, to protect the consumers. Now, what should regulators do? Well, um, back when I was with the ACCC, I had three fundamental rules. Rule number one was you cannot feel the need to be liked. You've got to feel the need to be respected. I had a senior manager that came to see me for breakfast one day and he said, Graham, what's, what, what do you say about me? I said, mate, do you feel the need to be liked? I knew the answer. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, yes, I do. I said, you will never be a leader. You'll never be a good regulator for as long as you feel the need to be liked. You've got to feel the need to be respected, not feared, but the need to be respected. Item one. Item two, You've got to be frank and fearless in dealings. I actually got a pair of cufflinks. They were given to me when I left the ACCC. That one's got on it uh, frank and that's got on it fearless. All right? And that was the fundamental message to put out there. Frank and fearless, that's the approach you've got to have uh, in dealing with um, clients or, in our case, dealing with companies, as we were the ACCC, is, is throughout is to be frank and fearless about what we, um, we, we, we view to be uh, you know, important uh, in the public interest. Uh, and then the, the third element was to be totally committed to act in the public interest. Now, you know, I've, I've done a bit of building work, and I don't do it myself, I get people to do it for me. Um, and um, uh, sometimes been owner build. But I've got a, um, a building surveyor. I'm not even sure he's in the audience. I won't ask him or her to put up a, his hand because you know, it'd probably embarrass him. But I would swear by this guy any time. I'll tell you why. He's frank and fearless. He, he keeps the builders absolutely in line. I was actually just looking there at a report he gave on a basement that was done for some concrete, by some concreters a little while ago. And he, he sent me a note the next day after he came to inspect it. He said, look, I'm alarmed about what they've done in terms of your next door neighbour. And the risk is that if they don't sort this out very quickly, there's a real risk that the next door neighbour's house will suffer damage. Now, I wanted him on my side to actually be able to do that. It was, he was being tough. He was telling my concreters, you haven't done it right. I wouldn't know. I know what a capping beam is. I know how 
deeper hole is, but I can't do anything more. And that to me is the role of the building surveyor. It's to be frank and fearless, to tell it exactly as it is, to actually say, I'm acting for you, the client, to keep those that are doing work for you absolutely in line to get the result you want because you don't know, you've got that asymmetry of information. So I, I don't know, I've got that asymmetry of information. So he's my, he's my friend, he's my supporter, but at the same time, he's got to be tough with those that I've engaged to do the building work. And, you know, God bless him that I've got him there and I'd use him any time as my building surveyor. John, I want to talk about the 75% that hope they're doing the right thing. Well, and, and have a genuine intention to. Yeah, uh, and our obligation. Uh, Graham's mentioned the um, Commissioner Haynes' report. Honestly, reading parts of that report, it's almost embarrassing to, um, to read the way he has had to provide an almost kindergarten-style lecture to the financial regulators and institutions to say, guess what, not everyone's a nice person out there. Um, there might be a few grubby elements that we might need to stick it to, right? That, you know, there is this, this myth that permeates um, a lot of regulators, um, and can I say, having run three of them, um, the default amongst all of them was to not regulate. I, everybody convinces themselves that, well, we need more education, uh, we need more persuasion, that people mean well. Yes, most people do but some don't. They are just rogues and grubs that drift across the economic landscape trying to find a place to make a lazy dollar. And it's the 75%, the people like, mo like all of us, who just want to do the, good th the right thing and just want to make a fair living, they are utterly, utterly dependent on us to be able to do that. They, they've got no one else to turn to. It is like nothing turns good people into doing bad things more than turning a blind eye or thinking that you can persuade an or the grub element of an industry. It's just so naive. It's ridiculous. In fact, every survey that you see of regulated groups calls for more regulation. More. Obviously not on them, right? But the grub next door who's cutting their lunch who means that they have to cut corners. You want to see it in health and safety when I ran WorkSafe. Almost, there are very few people who actually deliberately put people at risk. But if you don't stick it into those people who do do that, you make ordinary, decent people's life a misery, an absolute misery, because they can't do the right thing for fear of losing their business. And, and John, sorry, Brian, look, look what happened to the Royal Commission. You've got three, maybe four big banks that have cast a pall over the whole banking industry. Yep. How many of you actually think about the good guy, Macquarie Bank, that was interviewed, was subject to cross-examination, mm. and came out looking like a clean skin? In fact, you don't think of that. All you think about is the, the three and uh, you know, Westcap, Westpac got let off a little bit more lightly. You think of the, the, those three. Today, while you guys have been in here, there's been a, um, an outing of Cardinal Pell. Um, uh, and the conviction that was uh, uh, brought against him in December last year, and that's been out. It's the big news of the day. Think about it. You've got thousands, tens of thousands of priests in the Catholic Church today, all of whom have been tarnished by a small group that have been the subject of these sexual abuse claims. And, and, and so I'm, I'm with you. It's, mm. it's the rogues that cause the problem. It's the rogues that then turn around and, and it's the rogues that will then turn around and will be the cause of government saying, um, hey, if you can't sort out these rogues, then we're going to have to sort it out ourselves and we have to do it by more and more regulation. Yeah. I'll never forget a psychologist who came to a, um, a group where I was running a senior management conference. He held up a massive sheet of white paper. There was a little black dot on it. He said, what do you see? A mosquito a fly, a spider, a bug, a beetle. He said, what about the large sheet of white paper? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Trevor, I want to ask you, um, you've talked about that the reason for regulation is about public safety. We've heard this morning a lot of people saying it's difficult because laws change all the time. No doubt you've got a big work program in terms of potential changes that, that might be brought in in Victoria. How, when you're developing policy and creating regulations, what ways are there for you to ensure that public safety and public um, uh, 
the commitment to, to the public good is able to be seen through those laws mm -hmm. and, and how do you, what guidance can you give to this group around how they should interpret um, reforms and, and legislation to do their job with that in mind. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, so, I think, so I think part of it is just always coming to the question of reform with the lens of, of what's the point. So reminding ourselves when we're formulating our advice to the minister and thinking about options, why are we doing this and, and what is this trying to achieve? It's very easy to get kind of caught up in the kind of minutiae of, of changing a particular provision of an act or a reg, but um, it's about a bit of a discipline internally about reminding ourselves that this is actually about achieving public safety and about, um, you know, furthering those objectives. Um, and so the other part of it is in regulatory design, I think, um, effective engagement with industry around understanding what the practical impacts of some changes are. And I'll, I'll sit up here and admit that that's something that we could improve on. We try and engage uh, with industry and we use a, a range of consultative bodies that exist. The Building Regulations Advisory Committee is one that we use extensively to try and understand um, what the practical impacts of changes will be on the ground because I think um, there's always a risk of unintended consequences and we need to remind ourselves of what the purposes are. But I think for, for practitioners um, who, are, who have the, you know, the difficult job of interpreting the rules and applying them um, in a practical way, I think it's about thinking about what the point of the rules are. So reminding oneself that the point of these rules is to ensure that buildings are built safely, uh, that they're you know, built to the code, that they achieve um, you know, the outcomes that the community reasonably expect and that, that that be the lens through which kind of interpretive decisions are made rather than is there a way, is there a way to see this as compliant? I would say the question is, should this, should this be built this way? You know, is this the right way to build this thing and interpret the rules and regulations through that lens rather than can it be compliant? Graham, you're chomping. Oh, yeah. Look, I'm so <laughs> pleased you said that, Trevor, um, because it was the other overlay that we put through the ACCC and all the regulatory organisations have been involved in. It's the can we, should we test. Um, Hayne refers to it, Hayne borrowed it, I like to think anyway, from the report we did on the Commonwealth Bank. And we said this look, you know, lawyers will tell you what you can do, they won't necessarily tell you what you should do. And what is much more important, in my view, is to say, should I do this? Should this? So if we're looking, as you've said, Trevor, if you're looking at a, um, at a building issue, a building project, and you say to yourself, if I really, really try, I could probably tick this off as complying with the regulation, but should I? Yeah, does it make sense? Is this the sort of thing that I'd be proud to read about tomorrow morning in the morning newspaper? It's the morning newspaper test or it's the Four Corners test, the 7.30 report test. I'd say to Adele Ferguson now, it's the Adele Ferguson test because she's the one that's exposing this all the time. But you know, you know, I, you, you, everyone knows what you should or shouldn't do. And that is a much easier test to apply than the can we. You've got to comply with the can we test. That's the, the law, that's the regulations. But layer on top of that, the should we test. Should I do this? Should I authorise that? Should this building be built in this way or is it going to cause a problem in the future? It's a really good test to overlay on the can we. Matt, I want to bring you into the conversation. So you've been heading up the, the cladding, statewide cladding audits. What does good regulation look like in the context of this new crisis and this new way to start afresh, I suppose, on resolving what is a big problem? Yeah, and I think that the challenge with cladding is, and the minister said it this morning, is it's 25 years in the making. You know, we've, it's been a very, very long journey to get here, and it'll be a long journey to get out of it. But that doesn't stop us doing things right now to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And, you know, I think when I, when I look out there, I still get surprised as... I hear stories about our inspectors going out looking at jobs that are happening now and people still trying to get away with doing the wrong thing, even though there's a conversation about 
liability and impact on community and, and you know, uh, ha how this will play out over time. So, you know, I, I think with, with cladding, people need to say, look, however this occurred, it's not acceptable anymore. It's got to stop. That, that sort of behaviour has got to, got to stop in that practice. Uh, you know, good regulation. I think it's probably fair to say in the cladding space, we're not playing a traditional regulatory role. We're playing a role that is a combination of regulation, a combination of uh, responsibilities of municipal building surveyor, uh, in some cases working with private building surveyors. Uh, so, so it isn't a, a straightforward traditional regulatory role. Um, but, you know, I look out, it's, you know, I, I worked with John for five years, by the way. I had the, had, had, uh, the great fun of, of working with John every day for five years. And I look out here, you know, talk about the 5%. You know, I'm, we, I think we can safely assume everyone in this room, if I said, you know, are you in that 5%, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put your hand up. We're preaching to the converted. You're the ones that want to do the right thing. The challenge for us is amplifying that voice. And so, you know, we're a little regulator, we're 411 people uh, in a very big state, in a very big industry. So, you know, for us, influencing matters, we can do it through you, through amplifying, and we can do it by hitting that 5% really hard when we need to, to change behaviour. And that is non-discretionary. We do not have the discretion to decide whether or not we regulate we are the regulator, we have to regulate. Where we do have discretion is where we put that effort. I'll stop there. That's right. John, you've been brought into regulators off the back of crises and criti criticisms on a number of occasions and helped them through change and improving their practices. Can you provide the audience with some examples or stories about that mm. and give them some light at the end of the tunnel? I mean. The, the thing that comes with this current situation the building industries face is opportunity, yep. as well as, of course, great, in some cases, shame and, and worry and challenges. Yeah. Oh, no, look, there's plenty of good news in this. Um, we were having a debate recently about um, uh, the top 10 business books of all time. About half of those books are written by individuals who've been incredibly successful and they then write a book telling you what you should do. Um, more importantly, the other half are written by academics who go and look at organisations that are really successful and try and pick out why. Um, almost without exception, organisations and institutions who do great things started off in great trouble. Um, it is extremely difficult, some people can do it, but it, generally I've found it really difficult to be running an organisation that's going well and then kick it up to be great. It's actually easier to take an organisation or an institution that's in deep, deep trouble and then turn that into the catalyst for reform. And there's no doubt in my mind, cladding is our catalyst for reform. Right? We have, pardon the pun, a burning platform in more ways than one. Um, uh, and we, we have the opportunity to take stock. And you need that because you can almost map the life cycle of regulatory regimes. Every one of these institutions, including the one of which you are a part, was only ever established to do one thing, and that is to fix a problem. Well, I didn't just think it would be a good idea to have it. So there was something bad happening out there, and a community, through its parliament, decided we want a lot less of it, passes laws to make things illegal, and then creates institutions to enforce those laws. And without exception, over time, those institutions drift away from the problem that they were created to fix, and they start to focus more and more on their own survival and less on fixing the problem that the community wants fixed. And of course, the irony is that the more that you focus on survival, the less chance of surviving you've got. Because the community doesn't give us stuff about anything except is the problem getting better. Now, the problem for us, it's in the Act that says our job is to protect the public or the community in relation to the built environment. So if you're not sure what to do, just make a decision that protects the community in relation to the building environment and you'll be on safe ground. People might argue whether you've done enough protecting, but if in doubt, just protect people. Because when you're held to account, that is the only defence that you have. So in the case of uh, WorkSafe was a classic case. We had 
We, we couldn't work out what we were. Um, trouble is, the death rate was just spiralling out of control. And once we started to focus on one thing, which is there'll be fewer people hurt tomorrow than there were today, and we're going to hold ourselves to account for that number, and we started to really get some traction. Interestingly enough, the, the, the response was, hang on, why would we judge ourselves by an outcome that we don't control? You know, employers employ workers, we don't, we're just the regulator. And the answer is, bad luck. That's what the community's paying for. They want to see the number comes to come down. Our job is to find a way. The EPA was very similar. When Matt and I joined, you could not ask two staff the question, what are we here to do, and get the same answer. We couldn't work out whether we were there to solve climate change or to fix tips or to protect endangered. We had nowhere all over the place. And because we're all wonderful, passionate people who want to make a difference, we don't just sit pat, we go and do stuff. So all this disconnected work being done. Once you come back and say, actually, we're here to protect the environment and protect the community, make decisions to do that, we started to get some traction in that regard. This is our opportunity. We are here to protect <coughs> the community in relation to the built environment. We need to make decisions. And by the way, if you, the, 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 the instance was raised of going to the VBA, and that's, the forum's fantastic, it's wonderful to elevate that and say, we think something should be done, and the VBA says we won't stand by it. Do not accept that as an answer. Box on. You've got to box on. The EPA, when Matt and I were there, decided not to challenge a dreadful decision that had been made by a tribunal, but ended up having a whole suburb built next to a cap tip, which had to end up being in a state of emergency and everyone evacuated. Do not accept a bad answer. You are here to protect the community. Mistakes get made, box on. Appeal, challenge, push. Can, can I, That's how it works. Can I, yeah, before you do, I'm going to open it up to questions in a second, but yeah. whilst you're having a think about what you want to ask and we're getting the mics out, Matt. Thanks. I was just going to say, the box on, it sounds easy, but it's not. Because yeah. one of the, when you look at uh, the construct of Australian organisations, their default position often is avoidance. Mm. If you look at the stats, it basically says most businesses are operating in an avoidance kind of... Um, organisation, and it's hard to break that habit. It's hard mm. for any organisation, let alone... As we often used to say, Matt, whatever you do, don't make a decision, and if you do, wipe your prints off it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> the path of least resistance, the war of attrition, so many slogans for it. Mm. Yeah. We've got some questions for this highly eminent panel. Did I see a hand go up over here? No? One down here, bro. Down here. Peter. Here it comes, Peter. <laughs> Peter Jolly is my name. So, um, very interested in that talk about the 5% the and the 75% who are in, in a difficult position because there's a cost of compliance and, and the, the race to the bottom with, uh, against those 5%. So we've got private building surveyors in the room and MBSs, and we've got the VBA in the room uh, today who are regulators. Councils are also key regulators in all this. Uh, MBSs can't do anything at the end of the day unless the councils uh, are providing the, uh, the, the dollars and the resources and also the wi willingness to uh, take on the 5% and prosecute, mm. because that's not a function of the MBS. That's a, another statutory position, actually. It's the person authorised by council to bring proceedings. They need to be here today, and I'm just wondering what's going to be done to get the councils into the tent, because uh, it would appear to me that they're not in the tent in any of this. John, you would have faced this in EPA land with council's role in that framework. Yeah, I think councils are a hugely fascinating, wonderful institution, but they certainly are problematic when it comes to this work. Oh, uh, um, The number nine best-selling book of all time in business books is The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, habit number one of effective people is what the author referred to as being proactive, which is the people who are really effective only focus their effort on the things that they can influence. Uh, you can't influence everything, and councils are, an, are a nightmare. I, I regularly, over the journey, have had 
um, colleagues, really fantastic colleagues, say, look, we need more resource, we need more of this, but actually we're not doing stuff that we can do. The way to get resource and to get support, um, as the saying goes, those that do the work have the power. You've got to do, right? You work your way into a position of influence and resource. Remember, we are here to solve problems that the community valued enough to empower and create legislation and to create things. My experience at the regulators I've run is that once you are seen to be having a red hot go, having a real crack, there is an, an enormous amount of support that comes to you from the community and that with it, councillors sniff that breeze and um, um, uh, funding comes your way, but you've got to gut your way into it. As Matt said, it's, I'm, I'm making it sound easy, I know it's really hard, but focus on the things you can control, make the decisions you can make, and you'll be amazed what sort of support comes your way. Don't make those and everybody will abandon you. And I think we'll need to look at this more closely in the workshops, Peter, in terms of what, what are we doing? What are, the, what are the next steps? 34 people want asked this question, and it's one for you, Graham. Why not introduce standardised minimum permit fees to reflect the amount of time an RBS needs to carry out their role? No competition will drive industry cohesion. The competition expert, oh. is that the answer? <laughs> Look, Let's I hear this all fees. the time. All the time you hear introduce standardised fees. The first time I faced up to this was in 1974, November 74, when the Trade Practice Act was introduced. I was a lawyer back then. I was a member of the Law Institute of Victoria um, Council, and I said, I think what we ought to do is to apply the Trade Practice Act to lawyers and abolish standard conveyancing fees. Well, was there an uproar? And then they agreed that they would um, have a working group, which I could chair. And I appointed all the right people to the working group, and of course, we, we all agreed that we should abolish standardised conveyancing fees and um, allow advertising. And they said, the sky will fall in, and you'll get shocking conveyances doing conveyancing work and everything will go wrong. Well, guess what? And you will have all encountered this in your dealings with clients and personally, um, the sky hasn't fallen in. There is competition for um, the cost of doing conveyancing. Yes, conveyancing clerks are doing the conveyancing for you, but we don't have any more complaints uh, or any more problems occurring in the conveyancing area. It actually worked out because that's how markets work. Markets actually allow the cream to rise to the top and allow the rubbish to get thrown out. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, I'll say two things in this way. This gives me a chance to say the other thing I wanted to say before. Um, so the first thing is to say, I, I'm not in favour of standard minimum fees. What they tend to do then is to remove competition. I think competition is always good. And what happens with competition is that people will start underbidding, underbidding, but then ultimately you do get um, a trade-off where consumers say, hold on, I know I can get a very low price there, but I'll get a better result if I pay slightly more and get a better quality position there. So I talked about my surveyor before. I've never ever queried his fees. I have no idea whether they're right or wrong. What I do know is that he's on my side. He's actually working for me um, as the client. There's a real politic I think we all ought to face up to, guys, and let me tell you what's happening at the moment. Look around the country, and what we're seeing is um, almost hung parliaments in every state. Yeah, there are somewhere there are majorities, hung parliaments at federal level, and you've got a lot of minority parties that are, that are developing. And they have particular agendas. And have you ever seen so many royal commissions in your life mm. as you're seeing at the moment? Mm. The Hain Royal Commission, the Aged Care Royal Commission, which is going to tell us all what we knew about aged care and known about it for years, but it's a means of just sort of bring it out there. You've got the Mental Health Royal Commission here in Victoria. We've had the Sexual Abuse Royal Commission. It keeps on going on. So you're going to get royal commissions. What happens is this, is that governments react to issues that become, um, if you like, popular at the time and at times hysterical. And they'll at times become hysterical because the media will run a particular case, will run a particular issue, it might be on Four Corners or it might be on Today. Is that Today, tonight, it's still there? I didn't go. 7.30. No, 7.30, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I know that one, no, current affair, whatever. So okay. it'll be on those, right? And, and suddenly it gets blown up. Mm. And then it'll hit the daily tabloids and suddenly you've got a really big issue and the government says, I better act on it, I'll call a Royal Commission. Don't think there is any industry that is exempt from that accountability, that inquiry. And you talk about your 5%, what'll happen is if there's a Royal Commission into any area of the building trade room, it could be as a result of cladding or the like, right? If there is, 
then all the people will be brought in there, they'll be, they'll be raked over in the same way as the directors of the NAB and the CBA and others were, were done over by the, um, the councillors sitting in Ken Hain. Reputation will be trashed. The 5% will be driven out of the market. They might even, might even be subject to prosecution and potentially going to jail because that's the sort of thing the governments react to do. And that's your way of cleaning your 5% out. But what it does, remember my white sheet of paper, it tarnishes the whole industry. And so there is, in my view, there is no industry today in Australia that can say to itself, we will never be the subject of an intense inquiry, either by parliamentarians or by royal commissions or the like. And that's when the 5% will do so much damage to the industry. What's the solution? Get them out of the industry. <laughs> Graeme, though, going back to the question about standardised fees, do you think with a building surveying business that has statutory responsibilities as compared to, say, conveyancing, which ultimately has to follow certain processes and so forth, but not quite the same, or other industries where it's purely consumer, customer driven, is there a difference and is there any point in time where standardised fees would need to be there to help support a certain benchmark of, of, um, of standard? OK, well, doctors are subject to an enormous amount of regulation. So are engineers. Architects who have got levels of regulation, perhaps not quite as much. Um, lawyers have got a lot of regulation attaching to what they do. You know, regulation that's set by law and then administered by the Law Institute and the like. Um, and the only standardisation, if you like, that's there at the moment is a requirement to put funds, as I recall it, into a, a, trust, uh, a trust fund to protect uh, clients uh, and to have um, compulsory uh, insurance, you know, professional indemnity insurance. Um, I've actually always wondered about even that, compulsory professional insurance. This is the problem when you have standard fees. So they still got compulsory professional indemnity insurance and standard rates? In, for lawyers? In laws, in law. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So what's happening is, Bronwyn, you are subsidising the rubbish because you're paying the professional indemnity insurance fees to cover something that may never ever be claimed against you, but it'd be claimed against the, the rogues, the rubbish. In the, in the, and, and that's why I always thought it was, it was wrong, that what ought to happen is those that are the rogues ought to be priced out of the market by saying, your yeah, professional indemnity insurance premium might be $2 million a year. That cuts you out of the market, so you're gone. It's one of the ways of getting rid of your five percenters. Um, and so I, I'm not... I've never been in favour of standardised fees for any industry or any organisation. It just removes the concept of competition. All right. Do I have anyone who wants to ask one? Or I'll go from the uh, Slido. A CBL, Commercial Builder Limited, I presume that is, is permitted to undertake a non-structural fit-out in a high-rise building the building surveyor limited isn't permitted to approve or inspect this work why so this is about i suppose the scope of these registration categories and subcategories and i guess we want to take that as a comment or um, do, do do you trevor or, or matt have a um i, I don't have a detailed answer on this spot Bron. No. i'm sorry and i'm sorry to whoever uh, to um, i think it's you and ask that question um, I'd need to go back and look at, at the specific scopes of work. So I'm happy if you want to come up to me after the um, after the session to look into that specific. I can't I can't give a detailed answer on the spot. I'm sorry. Okay. When was the last time a drafts person was prosecuted? I don't know that there are many offences. Maybe disciplinary inquiries. I know there was a number um, of disciplinary inquiries into drafts people. So I think that is happening. But the point I suppose is you feel that the spotlight is in the wrong place take that. Anyone want to ask a question or will I keep going from the... Thank you. Do you want to just wait two secs yeah, for the mic? I can almost hear you, but <laughs> my age, my hearing is going a bit fade. Uh, question for Graham. Um, just with the market economy, with building surveyors, how do we resolve the difference between what the consumer values the building surveying role to be compared to what the regulatory role of the building surveyor is? Yeah, look, it's, it's a difficult one, and I'll tell you what, what it goes to, and it's, it's something... I'm going back to all this history of me decades ago with the lawyers. See, lawyers had fixed fees but were never allowed to advertise their wares. They were never allowed to tell you how good they were or how bad they were. Um, and so there was what we called asymmetry of information and a big information gap between consumers and lawyers. And um, so people would, would be able to cut fees, but at the time they weren't allowed to advertise, you know, 
the, the, the quality. And there is always this trade-off between quality and fees. Um, and it seems to me that, um, in the end, what, you know, the, the obligation is on the professional, be it a doctor or be it a lawyer or an architect or a draftsman or a building surveyor, your professionals, um, to actually portray, um, to communicate to potential clients how good you are. Mm. And for that, you're prepared to charge a certain fee. Look, we've got to, I'm going through this issue of transparency in the medical profession at the moment. And there are doctors out there, specialists, that will charge $20,000 out of pocket because they've created an image about themselves as being the very best. And one of the things I think we've got to try and do is to get a lot more transparency so that we can say to all of us in this room, look, doctors A, B, C and D are charging a reasonable fee and they're all as good as Dr F, who's charging a massive fee up here. So it's, it's, it's a question of, of satisfying the consumer demand for the right amount of information to enable them to make a decision and um, the fee. So if anyone comes and asks me, um, uh, you know, can I recommend a good building surveyor, I'll tell them the name of my building surveyor because I think he's very good. I right? also tell them the name of some engineers I think are crap. Um, right? and, and I wouldn't pay them. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, the, and that's the word of mouth they can get around that will actually ultimately be able to, to, to say that a particular person should be able to charge a bit more whereas others are going to have to charge less because, frankly, they're not quite that good. John? Uh, I, I was just interested, Ron, because that question is sort of not unrelated to a couple of questions that are coming up about, um, you know, why doesn't the community value us? Would we recommend our kids go into the profession? These sort of things. And to me, um, having seen a bit of this before, they are a bit of a symptom of where we're at in that we are focusing, not surprisingly, on what we do rather than the outcome we produce. It's, it's never going to be a case that the community will be interested enough in, the, in our work to value the activity. What we've got to focus on is this is the result of our work. This is the outcome, and the outcome is yeah. protection. The outcome is peace of mind, and the community places a huge value on that. Um, I mean, if I could be assured that I could get an apartment that was waterproof, I would actually <laughs> place a high, but I'm not. Um, you know, the, I think, but in order to be able to say to the community, the outcome that we deliver is worth having, we actually have to commit to that outcome. Yeah. So, you know, the, th the only thing standing between us and our kids wanting to do your job, or the community valuing what we do, is us committing to the outcome, which is protecting the community. And honestly, there's an enormous amount of, like, because the poor, hapless public is dependent on us. And I think in the, my, my, my last point in terms of would I recommend to uh, our kids to be in the profession, well, that's actually in our hands. Um, in my experience of, uh, of leading people, sometimes thousands of them, there is no shortage of people out there who, in their working life, want to make a difference. None at all. In fact, they're... More and more people out there come to us looking for a job, wanting to make a difference. You're in the business of making a difference. So make one. <laughs> make a big one. Graham. Right? And don't give up till you make one. And you'll have no worries attracting great people to come and do what you do. So we've got a hand up up here. While we get a mic up, up the stairs, Graeme. Yeah, well, I was going to actually wanted you to ask the question, um, to what extent is a surveyor required to be frank and fearless yep. on site? when all practitioners and trades should be registered practitioners, when do the VBA step in? Hey, listen, you've got a professional responsibility. You go on site. You know, people might be registered. I, I told you, the, the experience I had of the, um, the concrete is registered with all the authorities from the VBA to be able to act as builders, and yet my surveyor said, I'm alarmed about what you've done. Right? And he was frank and fearless. He told them straight out, this is what you've got to do. You've got to do it tomorrow morning or else. Right? And he told me, the client, and then I said, fix it. You're not going to get paid until it's fixed. And if you don't get it sorted out by tomorrow morning, the VBA will be brought in, as will the council and everything else, and I'll close the site down. Right? That's, what, that's what the surveyor is supposed to do. You're acting for the client. You're there to actually help and to provide that advice. So I say, be fr for heaven's sake, be frank and fearless in the public interest, but more importantly, in your client's interest, in, in advising the client about what's required. And, and if the client says, what do I do? You say, well, I can, I can contact the VBA, or you can bring the local council in, close the site down, 
don't allow the work to continue with this crowd, don't pay them any more and close off their contract if need be. Justin. Um, given that um, building surveyors can't be on a building site 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the construction process, do you think it's fair to say that if the major scrutiny and prosecution and the enforcement side of the VBA was focused on the trades and the builders and really hammered them, that they would see the benefit in paying good dollars to get good building surveyors to provide them with a good service which would result in a good industry outcome? Yeah. Matt? Oh, or it's, it's not an unreasonable, not an unreasonable mm -hmm. comment. I guess, you know, when, when you're a regulator looking at an industry this big, you're looking at where's your greatest risk, putting your energy where your greatest risk is. What you're suggesting there is quite legitimate, which is, you know, if there are practitioners doing the wrong thing and that's the greatest risk and that's the greatest risk to the community, uh, put, put the energy there. I think, you know, really the conversation today, and I said it before, is, you know, how do, we, how do we amplify this? How do we all play a role in, uh, in, in that influence? Hold us to account for doing our job. If you don't think we're doing that, uh, that job well enough, and you know, some of the comments, clearly that's the case, uh, hold us to account. Trevor, just yeah, get, like, just get a add, response. Add to that, I think, um, look, there's no doubt we're having a conversation that's focused on building surveyors, because we're in a room full of building surveyors, but, no one, I don't think any of us are going to sit up here and say that the, the systemic issues that the building industry is facing, the, the kind of crisis that we find ourselves in in relation to cladding and, and non-compliance is entirely of the surveying profession, no. profession it's making. It's, it's not. It's not. So it's not, it's not that we're sitting here saying it is all on surveyors to fix this. But equally, surveyors and the surveying profession are going to be part of the solution if we're going to crack this nut. There's no doubt about that. The, the, the role of the surveyor is unique in our system. Um, and, you know, I can provide whatever advice I provide to government and the VPA can do whatever it, it does to the best of its capability as effectively as possible. But if we're not joined up with all the people in these rooms to deliver on the kind of outcomes that John and Graham have talked about, to deliver for the public, we're not going to be able to achieve it. So absolutely, the rest of the building industry has a long way to come and a long, a, a long journey of cultural change to, to come on. But we, you know, to be honest, we need all of you to come on that journey with us and help lead the rest of the industry in the right direction. Peter's got the microphone again. And then over, is that you, Colin? Peter no? Jolly again. Oh, it's John. Yep. Um, so I understand, Graham, you're the owner builder and you want quality outcome and, and you've got a vested interest in you know, having a good building surveyor. It's not necessarily the, the case when the, the building work's been carried out by a builder. Uh, so one of the practices out there that I, I hear about all the time uh, working in local government is, um, so under the Act there were changes made that, that uh, compelled the situation where the owner has to appoint the RBS for domestic building work. Builders actually um, say to their uh, owner clients behind the scenes regularly, this is part of their routine, uh, that we have a preferred building surveyor or a pair of building surveyors and this is the building work cost if you choose our preferred building surveyor. If you want to choose your own building surveyor, there's a penalty. Now there's a reason why uh, that's the case. So this is a sham in the system that everyone knows about, that's acknowledged, um, clearly uh, isn't being addressed, but those builders don't have a vested interest in getting the best th building no. surveyor the cream. Those builders clearly have a, a preference for the owner to be, I suppose, blackmailed into selecting their preferred building surveyor uh, for a reason, which I won't go into now, but these are systemic issues how does the panel see issues like this could be or should be addressed? Can I start with answering that? Because when that reform came in, at the same time, so did directions to fix, which mean at the inspection stages where things are going wrong, owners get direct notice of it. So I do think there's been an issue with that reform 
around appointment. I don't think it's been as effective as was intended, but there were other things put in place to try to keep owners um, being communicated with when things were going off the rail, which I think, well, tell me, has that worked? Has that been any better? But I think more your concern is what about the developers who actually don't have a concern about the long-term um, viability of that building and their special purpose vehicles that are going to fold up and go away at the end of the day? That, that's more of my concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's right. Does anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I'd say to the first is, yeah, I'm a bit puzzled. I, I, I assume that most people have got some common sense, but um, that's probably you know, a bit of an over-expectation. Um, and, and so that if a builder said to me, you know, premium if you select your own surveyor, et cetera, I said, well, you can go and get stuffed and you're not even going to quote on this job because I don't like the way you operate. Right? I, I just simply get rid of them. That, to me, is the wrong ethical and appropriate um, professional standard that I'd expect from a builder. If a builder says to me, Graham, I want you to appoint your own building surveyor, and you appoint the person that's going to hold me to account for the best result, then I say, right, you're already up there, and I'm almost prepared to pay you a premium to do the building job for me. Right? Now, maybe you know, I've got the wrong attitude, but it seems to me that's common sense. So how do you get that through to the vast majority of the public out there that wouldn't see through the sort of scam? Oh, it's a scam, by the way. It's not a sham. It's a scam uh, that you talked about. Um, I think that's where it's incumbent on. And this is where I think it's very important for governments and authorities and um, groups like building surveyors to actually get the information out there. You know, it's the sort of thing we tell people not to smoke is going to kill you. Well, we ought to be telling people, select your best building surveyor. Right, and how do we know who's the best one? Have a look at their websites and we'll see if they've got some, some um, you know, testimonials from people you know, right? Because if you do and you can see that John's given a testimonial or you know, Trevor or I've given one or Matt or whatever it is, you think, well, that, that, they must be pretty good. You know, but I'd, I'd, I'll take that and that's worthwhile. Not the anonymous testimonial from Susan Smith that um, you know, you've got no idea who it is because they're all just, you know, they're, they're shams they put up there. So that's the, it seems to me that that's, that's very, very important. Now, the developer that you've talked about that says, I don't care, I'll get this thing up for as little a cost as I can, they ultimately will do it once. And then, again, they ought to be brought to account. This is where the VBA can be so important in bringing them to account and saying, you know the building that this builder built, it's, 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 you know, you know, whether it's cladding or whatever it might be, watch out because this building has been a problem. And these are the people that were involved. I, <coughs> I've, I'm involved in aged care and I've, uh, you know, as a, for Dementia Australia. And I have a real burning anger about what's happening in aged care. The biggest anger I've got is that the regulator, the Aged Care Complaints Commissioner, refuses to publish the complaints received and that have been verified. By golly, what better discipline could you have than to have the consumer being informed that you don't deal with that aged care facility, or you don't deal with that builder, or you don't deal with that building surveyor, or with that architect, because they have been shown to have had complaints that have caused all sorts of problems. John Bordignon, you had your hand up, and you'll be the last question for this session. Thank you. Uh, John Bordignon, Portfield Council. Um, We've gone through a lot of um, audits now, cladding, um, done thousands of inspections. Surely we, we've also looked at some common issues and things that have come up. We're starting <coughs> to get a good feel for what's going on. Um, there's a million dollar question in probably everyone's minds is, what's Victorian building legislation gonna look like in 12 months time? And what sort of changes, if any, do you start off with a blank sheet? Are you gonna look at some of the the things that we found in, in these cladding audits and, or do you do a, a triage um, and put it through? I guess it's more a policy thing than a government thing and maybe a bit early, but we're certainly down this journey in a fair way. Um, yeah, we'd like to perhaps know sort of what good legislation is going to look like in the future, which I think was Bronwyn's question at the beginning. Um, so I think, I think that's one for me. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> so, so I think, I mean, the first thing to say is... Um, at present, there's no, you know, I don't have any authorising environment. There's no overarching government commitment to rewrite the Building Act or anything like that. But obviously, there is this kind of growing sense of, um, you know, uh, of 
of a level of dysfunction in the system. And you know, Bronwyn um, co-authored the Sheer Gold Weir uh, report, which points to systemic issues. We had the interim report of the Victorian Cladding Task Force highlighting systemic issues. So I guess all I can speak to is if, if government comes to me and asks me um, how, how ought we go about thinking about addressing these problems, how will I, how will I kind of think about it? And I think I'll, I'd think about it from two angles, and one is informed by those audits and analysis and information that we now have. We now have just numerous you know, points of data that point to some of the points of tension and points of weakness in the current system, and that's integral. But equally, I would encourage government not to just look at that and just look at the current regulatory settings, because if we want to future-proof our regulatory design, we can't just look at you know, an act that was developed in 1993. We need to be thinking about what is the construction sector going to look like in Victoria in 2025, 2030, 2035. What's the level of, of complexity, the scale of construction we're going to need in this state to support the level of population growth? And how do we design a system today that, um, that meets the needs of um, you know, the community moving forward? So I'd really, if, if I got asked that question, I'd really like to look at it with that kind of future proofing in mind. And, it's, and like John said, some of these things are pretty basic. It's about how do we put in place the levers so that we get the, the consistent 5% and we have the tools for the regulator to whack them hard when they're identified and keep them out of the system? How do we provide the transparency that Graham's talked about so consumers can make well-informed decisions? So I think I'd tackle it from those both ends, looking at the data we've got and then really thinking about how we future-proof our system so we're not just moving from one crisis to, the, to another in 10 years. Yeah. Hey, Brom, can I just grab one quick one? I noticed there was a bit of a trending question about what's the VBA doing about finding the 5%. Look, obviously the 5% aren't running around with a neon sign saying, I'm a grub, come and get me. Um, uh, so you've got to go and find them, uh, and what you've got to do is you've got to issue lots of regulatory actions against them. Com Commissioner Hain was scathing um, uh, on the uh, regulators and the financial because they don't escalate action. So you issue a warning, or a warning, another warning, and of course undertaking a warning. You've got to keep escalating it up. And the other point I just wanted to, you know, that Graham articulated perfectly is uh, what makes it tricky is that the community's expectations are not standing still. Right? They are just rising all the time. And Graham articulated in terms of the responsibility, say, in aged care about who's a good doctor. And I feel that as a member of the board of the TAC, where we fund huge amounts of surgery and general practice, you know, we know that some doctors are better than others. You know, we know that some surgeons are better than others. We know that some physios are better than others. I can see very quickly the community's expectation on us saying, well, how do you use that? You're obliged to use that knowledge to the benefit of the people that we protect. And this is where it's all going. Like, you know, it's, it's hard enough now to do the job, but the community's expectations do not stand still. Yep. In my regulatory work over the last 20 years, I've been amazed at how much they've grown of us. So we've got to get our skates on and keep rising yep. to that. Can I just quit? Sorry, and I know you've got to stop, but I want to quickly <laughs> summarise and to repeat what Trevor said. You need a tough, unrelenting, vigorous, rigorous regula regulator, item one. Haynes says that very clearly. You need much more transparency so that the world, your clients, know who are the good ones and who are the bad ones. Right? And, that's, and then the third thing Haynes says is simplify the law. You know, don't add more and more regulations. I noticed there's been some issues today raised about the more and more regulations that are added over and over and over again. Uh, and that's a tendency for draftspersons and for um, uh, those in the regulatory world to, to complicate things an enormous amount. Look at the outcome that you're trying to achieve and then say, is there a simple way I can actually express this that might actually make it, you think, more uncertain? Actually, I'll tell you what makes it uncertain for. When you say, you shall not mislead and deceive your client, that's a bloody good law. I'll tell you who hate it. The lawyers, because they can't find a loophole, <laughs> right? And but it's really good because what it says to you is, I better be careful because that just might be interpreted as misleading and deceptive. All right. On that note, thank you to our panelists. You can join me. <laughs>